Hello and welcome to the Classical Stuff You Should Know podcast. This is a podcast put out by a bunch of classical teachers who love classical education and want to tell you the stuff you should know about classical education. I think really it's just an outpouring of our natural inclination to teach. Like we didn't get enough of it in class, and so <laughs> we right. have to find complete strangers and do it over the airwaves Good. and teach exactly. more. Yeah, it's like a it's sa- a, it is a Saturday is a that Saturday we're recording right now. We this is an week. afternoon. I could be outside. Yeah. It's beautiful weather. And, and I said I'm, you're here talking about classical education. Yeah, indoors talking about classical education. Now, if you are a longtime listener to the podcast and you're wondering who that new voice is, that is our own Thomas Magby. Howdy. First time on the podcast. Thomas, Long time give... listener, first time on the podcast. <laughs> Thomas, you want to give a little bit of your credentials, <laughs> your sure. classical credentials. This is We asked this question of Catherine. You okay. did. You sure did. But she actually had credentials, so that, yeah. there was that. Um, I'm the Dean of Student Life at Veritas Academy. I work with uh, high school students. Uh, also, I get the opportunity to teach eighth grade discipleship, um, school of rhetoric leadership, and I'm directing our one-act play, which will be on November 9th, and everyone should come to. That's right. Free yeah. plug. Holla. Right. One act play. Um, who knows when this podcast will be published? Oh, that's actually true. This is probably going to be published like way after <laughs> November 9th. What have I done? So great job, students. <laughs> job. <laughs> well so done. Say, great job to the one act play students. Yeah. And of course, we have with us AJ Hannenberg, who is the teacher of ninth grade English and co teacher of the rhetoric program. And senior English. And senior English. That's yeah. right. And you New do probably a bunch of other things that I always forget. I do. Faculty and, uh, sponsor of the writing club. Faculty sponsor of Writing Club, faculty sponsor of Bob Ross Club. Mm. Bob Ross Club. That's a good one. And regular attender of the Board Games Club. <laughs> well done. Well done. And dean of House Mueller. Mm. And DJ for the dance. I do a lot of man, I do a lot of man. Yeah. And I'm yeah. Graham Donaldson. I teach 10th grade English, senior English, thesis. Um, I think I'm the club sponsor of some clubs, but I can't remember. And I also that means you're not. So maybe there's some sure. kids running around with no no sponsor, with no sponsor. just doing their. Own and I'm thing. also the dean of the glorious House Francis. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's get down to it. So AJ, I know that you have things to tell us. A classical thing we should know. What is that classical thing? Before I get started, I'd like to warn any parents that are listening to this with kids. This is not a particularly friendly topic to oh, young this ears. This is going to be a great podcast. So. <laughs> You might want to skip this one and head on to another podcast if you've got kids in the car or if you're listening with, listening with young, young children. Uh, this is Greek mythology at its most sinister, so you might just keep that in mind as you continue. Today, I'll be talking about the House of Atreus. The, this is a, a family from which stems quite a few plays, quite a few stories. Uh, Shakespeare has oft copied some things that happen to this family, and it's it's embroiled in the Trojan War. I think I mentioned it way back in our Introduction to Classic Literature podcast. And uh, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a play based on this. Uh, Aeschylus wrote the Oresteia based on this. There's There are a ton of things that stem from this one story. And I sort of, it's an interesting story, so I wanted to tell you about it. I also have to apologize for the strange audio. We're using three mics today, and we're still figuring out how that all works. So if my voice is echoing from all sides of your car, uh, I, you know, I apologize. If you would like to donate high-quality yes. recording equipment yes. to the Classical Stuff You Should Know podcast, contact us at Classical, Classical Stuff at Veritas Yeah, your guys' voice sounds fine, but mine is coming from, like, all directions at once. I, Anyway, I, we're sorry. We're working on it. We're figuring out the audio. So this story begins with a fellow named Tantalus. And Tantalus was a man beloved by the gods, but he harbored a deep secret hatred for them. And he wanted to test their omniscience, how much they could actually know. And so he invited all of the gods over to his house under the pretense of a dinner. And what they didn't know was that he had murdered his own son, Pelops, and cooked him into pies. And these pies are what he served to the gods. Most of the gods instantly recognized what was in the pie and said, no, I'm not eating this crazy people pie. And, but one god, Demeter, whose daughter Persephone had recently been kidnapped and taken to the underworld, she is now the queen of the underworld, married to Hades, she was dist- completely distracted about the whole thing and ate a piece of the pie and said, oh, no, it's, it's people. And all of the gods were understandably pretty incensed at, sensed at this, and so they rebuilt Pelops, they brought him back to life, took all the pieces of the pie, and was remade he missing the person. Piece? Was he missing? He, one? he actually was. <laughs> really? Yeah, he was missing a chunk in his shoulder that oh. they replaced with ivory because Demeter didn't want to go through the trouble of trying to retrieve that bit. Good. 
So they re that that one piece of ivory is the beginning of the curse of the House of Atreus, right? It's the first piece. It's a it's like a taint in the blood that will continue down through all of the rest of the time. Why now, ivory? Why is ivory the the, the taintable material? I don't know, maybe it was handy. I'm I'm unclear on all that. Right. And and really there's there's a little bit of contention about where the curse actually starts, whether it starts with Tantalus or later with Pelops and something Pelops will do. Sorry, did you say why Tantalus did that? He he did it so that he could test the omniscience of the gods. Oh, okay. And so they... Because that's crazy. Sorry, that's just... That's crazy that he did that. Yeah. it's uh, It didn't turn out well for him. Right. They condemned him to Tartarus, and in Tartarus, he he's the guy that consistently tries to drink from a stream that is at his feet, and whenever he does, it recedes, and he can put it in his hands, but it'll run out of his hands before he can drink out of it. And he'll it's the fruit tree that's hanging over him, and every time he reaches for the fruit, the branches go, whoa, whoa, <laughs> and will keep him from actually getting the fruit. And this is where we get our word tantalized. Mm. It's from Tantalus. So Pelops, his son... That was his punishment, was to always desire and never get. And never get, mm. right, because he had fed something horrible to the gods. So his son Pelops didn't turn out to be that great of a guy either. He fell in love with this girl named Hippodamia, who was very cute. And her, she was so cute that her father, Onimaeus, I'm probably saying that name incorrectly, but he was also in love with his own daughter. And he had rigged a system where she would never get married. He offered her as a prize in a chariot race, but he had horses that were sired by the wind. And so he could never lose this chariot race. And invariably, he would catch up to the suitor, kill the suitor and then display the head on the outside of his palace during, during the race like he would kill catch up to the, the suitor and, I, and kill I don't him? know when he would kill them but they would end up Jeez. killed you and think that only happened once and people would <laughs> realize like, no that they, we're not doing this I race. think you are underestimating the cuteness, cuteness of of <laughs> hippodamia uh, so our our hero pelops son of tantalus figured this out he mm. knew that it was kind of a rigged thing and so he also had some pretty impressive horses given to him by Poseidon, and he recruited a servant of the king, his charioteer, to fiddle with the chariot, remove the linchpins from the axle, and replace them with wax, hmm. so that during the race, his chariot would fall apart. And it worked. The chariot fell apart, and the king was dragged to his death, thus winning Hippodamia's hand for Pelops. And the way that he had gotten this charioteer to the the chariot's men to do it was by promising him the, him the first night with Hippodamia. Mm. He promised him her virginity. Oh man, brutal! Seriously. Or a sack of gold. In some other tales, it depends. And when the servant moved to take his prize, Pelops didn't want to share and yeah. chucked him into the sea. Mm. And the dying curse of this servant was a compounding, or the beginning, depending on who you ask, of the curse of the house of Atreus. So Pelops wait, marries. Wait, so he threw the servant into the sea, and the horses were given. And the horses were given by Poseidon. Poseidon. So what did Poseidon think about all this? Is he still on Team Pelops, or is he upset that he that he did this horrible thing and drowned his servant? You see, I wish I knew the answer to that <laughs> question, but but I don't. I know. I wish I knew more about this. I've read some, but usually the story the stories that I've read focus p- particularly on nearing the end of the tale. Because I know Poseidon is a man or God who, when he gets a favorite or he or he sides with somebody, he's going to stay sided with that person. Like yeah. you see that in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah, are you thinking Odysseus and how he hated Odysseus? Exactly, and he hated him no matter what he did. Um, I'm just wondering if he if Pelops could do no wrong in Poseidon's eyes. Like if he gave him the horse, he obviously favors him. But uh, I don't know. That's I don't know. Pretty... Anyway, so he he uh, has a couple of kids, uh, Thiestes and Atreus. Atreus being the the namesake. guy, yeah, the namesake of the house. So Thiestes and Atreus, two brothers. And there was a king of Mycenae who was killed by some sons of Heracles because he'd persecuted Heracles and they were grumpy about it. So they killed him and then they consulted the oracle about who should be king. And it said it should be one of the sons of Pelops. Atreus, the older brother, was the clear favorite here. He made sense. He was very kingly. Uh, th- but there were some circumstances around this wager about who would be king that changed things. So Atreus did something silly that apparently they like to do in this house, and he promised Artemis his best sheep. He was like, I will sacrifice my best sheep to Artemis. And when he went out into his flocks, what he found was a golden fleeced lamb. Ah, crap. That he I didn't really didn't want to realize give away. I had. Yeah, yeah. he didn't know he had that. What? How did? Yeah. So yeah. instead of I giving it to that her, one. <laughs> he kept it, kept the fleece, kept the lamb, and then gave it to his wife, uh, Ariope. And so when 
Thiestes, his brother, said, hey, you know what? I think that the person should, who should be king is not the, the older brother of the two. I think it should be who can, whoever can produce a golden fleece. Now, the, uh, Atreus thought that he had one of these, and so he quickly said, "Yeah, that's a, that yeah. is that is the, the best way idea we I have ever heard." Yes, the king. Perfect. Yes, that's totally the way. And what he didn't know was that Ariope was his having wife. an affair. Oh wow! With, with the, his brother. Oh, there you go. So his his yeah his wife was having an affair with his brother, and she had given her fleece out of spite to Atreus to her lover Thiestes, and Thiestes produced the fleece. What fools we mortals be! Thus becoming king and making his brother not king. Atreus, though, was convinced that he was supposed to be king of the land, and so he went to the gods for help and then came back and convinced everyone that the gods wanted him for the kingship, and the proof would be when the sun went backwards in the sky for one day. It would rise in the west and set in the east, and it happened, and so they elected him king, and he banished his brother, So did, the Estes. Wait, so, the, so he actually convinced... Who's the god? Who's the chariot? Sun god? Apollo. Apollo. So we actually convinced Apollo to do this thing, and everybody got their, their fold-out chairs and like stayed up until dawn and watched. And it watched happened. The yeah, it, went it, happened. it was a crazy, crazy day. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we have the same thing happen in Scripture at one point. Right. Remember the war well, where he stops. had the sun stop in the sky? Yeah. That, is, ju- that is just as crazy as having it move backwards. True. Well, there's lots of these overtones, like, like um, the sort of wily... The person who's held up as the hero, but he's actually like a big jerk, and he's getting his way through devious means. I mean, I'm, there's like that's like a bit of the story of Jacob in there. This king that should be king based on how he looks, but it turns out he's not going to be a good king. Is like Saul. There's lots of there's yeah yeah. They're, I don't these are, these are I mean of course these are common themes, right? So yeah, yeah I was going to say that's just people, right? We yeah. we expect good looking people sure. to be better than they are, and we people do things deviously. Anyway, so he. Theestes is Except banished. Except in your case, Hanenberg, where um, it's the good looks actually translates I, to virtue of character. I deliver. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll promise. Good. All day, every day. <laughs> and okay. I've seen your sheep. I know you, so you've got a golden one. And I always check my sheep before, <laughs> yeah. before I promise I, before the before best one to Artemis. Them. That's just wisdom. <laughs> yeah, that's just planning ahead. So Theestes is banished, and Atreus takes the kingship. Atreus later discovers that his wife, Ariope, was sleeping with Theestes, and he is understandably hacked, so he plans some revenge. Wait, he didn't realize this once his brother had the with golden gold fleece. fleece? Yeah, I don't think that withitness <laughs> is, a, is a quality <laughs> of the You Atreus have one brothers. too? Where's mine? <laughs> what are yeah. the chances of that? I, ju- I misplaced it. I don't get it. Yeah, he had no idea. So anyway, he decides to bring back Theestes to get revenge on him, and he says, Theestes, come back. We're brothers. Let's bury the hatchet. Let's move past all oh, of this by the king way, stuff. You're the hatchet. <laughs> well, that's I I was waiting to make the like uh, bury the hatchet uh-huh. in somebody pun. Oh, there you go. So you stole it. Come, nice. on. Come on. No, it's okay. It wasn't oh, going to be good. Okay. The delivery was going to be very poor. So he brings him back and while he's entertaining Theestes prior to dinner, he kills Theestes's three young sons, who are by the way his nephews. Mm. So he or kills let me these guess. He bakes them into pies. Nailed it. Yes, he does. So he takes their torsos because uh, he cuts off all their extremities, bakes them into pies, and then feeds them to his brother, Jeez. Thiestes. And at the end of the dinner, he says, do you know what you just ate? And then brings out the extremities and starts taunting him with his son's pieces. Mm. And the problem is for Thiestes that the consumption of human flesh is taboo for the Greeks. Uh, if you do, I mean, it's taboo for us too. <laughs> I was going to say, not just the Greeks. But no matter the circumstances. Fun cultural fact. <laughs> <laughs> but no matter the circumstances, you are banished, right? Even if you were forced to do it, if it wasn't your choice, you're not oh. like cannibal all day, every day. So he is kicked out of. Fiestes, for eating. For eating. He's kicked about, out of Mycenae. But what about putting them in the pies? Does anything. What, what happens to Atreus? He's a king, man. Oh, um, that's messed up. Sorry. So anyway, Fiestes is banished, and he is a but, little. But he was already banished. Yes, now he's double banished double with banished. dead kids. Mm. So he's a, he's a little Touché. frumpy dumps about this. <laughs> yep. And he goes to the oracle to ask how in the world he can get revenge on his brother Atreus. So, so far, just to recap, we've gone from Tantalus, who messes with the gods, to Pelops, who killed his father-in-law to get his wife Hippodamia, to Atreus, who, along with some dirty deeds by Thiestes, has killed his nephews, fed them to his brother, and then banished his brother. So nothing good happening. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. So it's like... Uh, Cain killed Abel, but then oh, we are a couple that ways down the line. Then you have 
you have what, what's the um I think like Tribe of Benjamin stuff. Like yeah, 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 exactly. Like, and yeah. like cutting Kill people and, and mailing them yeah. around the kingdom. Yeah. Well, we're not done yet. <laughs> Buckle up, listeners. Buckle up. And this is, I mean, we have already been past the spot where you should have had your kids not listening. It's about to get a lot worse. So he asks Theestes at the Oracle, he says, how can I get revenge on my brother for this heinous murder that he's committed of my three young children? And the Oracle says back, you must have a child with your own daughter. Mm. What? So the Oracle's what? an enabler at this yeah. point. Like, yeah. You would what? think that the Oracle what? has the power to say, just should, like give just, it up, man. Yeah. Just go found your own country. Mm. It's a big world. And you're a you're a capable leader. Yeah. Just like go to Sicily and make you do your own thing. But, they but don't. No. No, yeah, they yeah. Yeah. And by the way, Pelops became worshipped later, and that's what why how the Peloponnese came about. Mm. The Peloponnese are named after Pelops. Mm. And geography isn't my best. Are they islands? The Peloponnese? Peloponnese Islands? So they're definitely seafaring people. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's where that name comes if from. If any of you out in listener land know the answer to that, you can email us <laughs> at, oh, this is a good time to plug our email address at, classical stuff at veritasacademy.net. You send any questions there, we'll try to answer. If you, so far, there's been nothing in there. Zero. So every time I open the account on my phone, it says, you're all done. And there's a picture of a little guy sitting in a chair, which I've never seen in an email box wow. before. Inbox zero. It's a, it's a great feeling. I do it whenever I'm feeling stressed. <laughs> so anyway, he as he leaves Delphi in the nighttime, he sees this girl going down to a stream and decides he's very attracted to her and attacks her as she goes down to wash and rapes her and then flees, leaving his own sword behind. And so Theestes leaves the area to go search for his daughter. And what he doesn't know is that the girl he just attacked and raped was his own daughter. Uh, hold on, I gotta, I gotta look for my notes for the name of the daughter. The girl. Give me it's half a rough a sec. family. Seriously. Yeah. Maybe I didn't write it down. Anyway, she. So he he had already found his own daughter. Mm-hmm. And then Atreus, searching for Theestes, knows that he went through Delphi, finds this girl, is very attracted to her, and says, I will replace my own... It's Pelopia. That's the name. Named after Pelops. So he finds the girl, and he finds Pelopia and says, well, my wife is the worst, so you are my brand new wife, and she's out. So he brings Pelopia. Not knowing it's his niece. Not knowing that it's his niece. And then pregnant with, with her father's child. He also doesn't know that. And so when she gives birth, he thinks it's his own. And so he raises this boy named Gisthus as one of his own sons. And he has two others, Agamemnon and Menelaus, mm-hmm. two guys that might sound familiar to you because they're the two primary kings in the Iliad, right? They're the great generals of the war. And we'll get to them, uh, I suppose, right now. So he's, he raises he raises Gisthus as his own sons. And but Agamemnon and Menelaus are the sons of Atreus. And, and then, then Aegisthus is the son, son of Thyestes, Thyestes and his daughter. So Thyestes is both his dad and his grandpa? Okay. Weirdly. And so Aegisthus is like the cousin slash cousin once removed for these brothers. So they're raised. And then uh, he Atreus is still trying to find Thyestes. And so he sends his two sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, not Aegisthus, so these two young boys go and search for Theestes at the... They're going to go to the Oracle and try to find out where he is. Well, it just so happens, Theestes has also revisited the Oracle because he can't find his daughter. He's like, I've been trying to have a kid with my daughter for years and I can't stink and find her, so I'm going to get some new advice. So he came for new advice and he is found by Agamemnon and Menelaus and they drag him back to their father, Atreus, who wants to kill him and get rid of this one once and for all. So he orders his son, Aegisthus, to take his sword and go and kill Thyestes. So as Aegisthus pulls his blade, it just so happens it's the, it's the same sword, sword okay. that was left when Thyestes fled. So Thyestes is like, how'd, how'd you get that sword? How'd yeah. you get my sword? Yeah. And he realizes what's, what's happened and tells the tale, like, I think I'm your dad. Mm. And they call Pelopia, and Pelopia says, yes, that's the sword that was left, and then realizes that she's been raped oh, so by she, her father. She didn't know that either. She didn't know that what? it was her dad that had raped her. And yeah. so she finds out at this moment, grabs the sword in her grief, and kills herself with the mm. sword. Aegisthus, understandably a little confused by this whole thing, decides not to kill Theestes. He takes the bloody sword 
back to Atreus and says, I have killed Thiestes. Mm. I beheaded him and shows the sword, the bloodied sword as proof. Atreus, overjoyed that this longtime rivalry has come to a conclusion, turns, makes sacrifices, and when he goes to the stream to wash his hands, he turns his back, puts his hands in the water, and Aegisthus stabs him in the back with his sword, killing his uncle slash uncle once removed, great great grand uncle. It gets really yeah, confusing in there. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those family trees that doesn't branch very much. Yeah. So Aegisthus and Thiestes, Thiestes then takes the the. Th- crown that he had wanted all along, Mm -hmm. takes back over, and then drives the two young sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, from the land. They flee to go to hang out with another king in Sparta, who Mm. had just given birth to two very famous people, Helen and Clytemnestra. Mm. Menelaus married Helen, and that's where we start the whole Trojan War business, right? Helen gets stolen. Agamemnon marries her sister, the less cute but just as cool Clytemnestra. And they had a happy marriage. Yeah, they... (laughs) Eventually. <laughs> Ugh, no, they The didn't. answer is no, they did not. So he, they gather an army, go back, drive out Thiestes and Aegisthus, and reclaim their homeland Mycenae. So Agamemnon begins to rule after his father Atreus in, the, in Mycenae, and Menelaus... Do they kill, they kill Thiestes? They just drive him out. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if they killed Thiestes. Uh, at this point, they're getting a little older, and I, I wish I was a little clearer on that point. Mm. And then Menelaus and... Helen go back and rule Sparta at, in place of Tindar- Tindarius. They actually turn out kind of okay. So at this point, we have gone from Tantalus to Pelops to Atreus and the Thiestes debacle down finally to Agamemnon, who rules this country with his brother Menelaus, ruling off in Sparta with his wife hmm. Helen. Helen gets, oh, sorry, my mic just cut out there for a sec for some reason. Helen gets stolen. The whole Trojan War happens. Eventually, Menelaus gets Helen back, and they actually kind of live happily after that. Everything goes kind of okay. And then Agamemnon, uh, sorry, to go to war, he had to lie to his wife Clytemnestra and sacrifice his own daughter. I went over that in a previous podcast. But he had uh, made another silly promise to Artemis. Or he it's did a something. Trait, right? Yeah, he did something silly with Artemis, and Artemis punished him by making him sacrifice his own daughter in order to get wind to go off to war. So he had lied to his wife, Clytemnestra, said that he was going to marry his daughter Iphigenia off to Achilles, very attractive, good warrior, and then instead killed her. Goes off to war, not talking to his wife again, and then wins the war and eventually comes back home. And so he has sacrificed his own daughter, and Clytemnestra is a little grumpy about this. And when he returns... What was his daughter's name? Iphigenia. Now, isn't did she, was she actually sacrificed? Because there's also a, an opera where she wasn't sacrificed. She like stays on an island. There are a couple different versions of the tale. In some, she just gets killed. Yeah. In some, Artemis has like, mercy on her, her. and yeah, yeah. swaps her out with a deer at the last moment. Mm-hmm. Which you think you'd realize it, but I guess <laughs> it was foggy and they couldn't really tell. Mm-hmm. And I think I would recognize human screaming as opposed to deer screaming. Deer. But you know what do I know? Anyway, sacrifices the daughter, goes off to war, comes back, not only having murdered their daughter, but also with other ladies in tow that he has claimed at Troy, along with a lot of wealth. And this is where a lot of the plays kind of focus, Mm -hmm. on this grand return of Agamemnon from the war that he has won and the glory that he has home. In the meanwhile, Clytemnestra has decided to shack up with none other than Aegisthus, Mm. the... I don't even know how he relates to her. It's a brother. It's cousin, 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 cousin once removed. So it's Agamemnon's brother. In-law? It's Br- Agamemnon's no. brother-in-law that he didn't realize. No, was. no. Agamemnon's oh, cousin. cousin. Woof. And yeah. cousin once removed because sure. it's a son of his cousin thing. And then so it would be cousin, cousin once removed in law, I think, to Clytemnestra. I don't think that's a thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, they're, they're together. I'm yeah. just getting sad. Yes. That's how, that's how I feel. They're together. Agamemnon doesn't know they're together, and she she says, welcome home, my great king, and makes him do some things that you shouldn't do. He walks on a red carpet, which is reserved for the gods. Mm. He has a little bit of impiety, and he doesn't want to. She kind of forces him to do it. And the whole time that one of the girls he has brought back from Troy is cursed with the... Is it Cassandra? It's Cassandra. And she can see the future, but she can't convince anyone that it's actually going to happen. So she knows that everything is going to end in death, but can't actually convince anyone. They're like, Cassandra, you crazy. Poor you talking Cassandra. some crazy stuff. Seriously. What's she talking about? Girl, you nuts. And that it doesn't work. She just knows it's going to happen and can see it coming and can't stop it. 
So Agamemnon does what any good man who just traveled a whole bunch does, and he went goes to take a bath. And while he's in the bath, Clytemnestra takes a bunch of cloaks, throws them on top of him so he can't fight back because he's a great warrior, and then stabs him through the cloaks with a sword, murdering her husband and putting herself and Aegisthus on the throne. Dang. Isn't there a son? Isn't Agamemnon's son? Is there a Laertes? Is that his name? Not Laertes. Orestes. Orestes. Yeah, yeah. Close. And that's the Oresti. Right? Yep. Yeah. We're, we're getting there next. So he, this, this is actually the first play of the Oresteia. It's yeah. the return of Agamemnon. It's called Agamemnon. He comes back. He gets killed. That's the end of the play. The next bit is about Agamemnon's son, Orestes, and his daughter, Electra. These two are brother and sister to Iphigenia. If you're if you're having a lot of trouble with this, you can look up a family tree online. I'm sorry I'm that it's so complicated. I'm straight and up taking notes. Right now. She's the she's the superhero Electra, like the the Marvel yep. superhero. Exactly. I think it's named after Jennifer, her. Yeah. Jennifer Gardner. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah, right. So yeah. if you want to Same imagine character. Jennifer Gardner, I should have been connecting this with people all along. Like mm. I think it'd be easy to think of Theestes as Bill Murray. Okay. Mm. Right. He'd be mm-hmm. a good Bill Murray, and then uh, Pelops. Who's the guy from Taken? Uh, oh, you mean our Irish? Like I have a certain, I have set, a certain of skills. set of skills. Um, yeah. What's his name? Who shouldn't the action star that shouldn't be an action star? Um, shoot. Um, he's in, you know this really doesn't matter action. to our podcast. Well, at all. Russell Crowe is Agamemnon in my mind forever and ever. Okay, I was thinking somebody a, bit, a little beefier and stupider because mm-hmm. in the Iliad, Agamemnon is not exactly good at the anything. I mean, he's great at war, but he's really bad at being a leader. But, he's bad. I was thinking planning. Like, Agamemnon comes from a pretty Liam terrible... Neeson. Liam Neeson. Sorry, Liam Neeson. Really important. I could Google. see Liam Neeson as Pelops. A Tantalus would have to be somebody sinister. Who's somebody who always plays a bad guy? Like Maybe William a British Defoe? guy. There you go. William Defoe. That's perfect. Um, so Agamemnon in the Iliad is a jerk, but he comes from a terrible family, and so he's not that much of a jerk in the Iliad. I mean, he is. No, but he totally like, is. But not like... All of this murdering your family and and, and uh, baking people into pies. Like I don't see Agamemnon baking people into pies. No, jerk. He he makes a mistake by crossing Achilles, right. and then later he makes some really awkward leadership decisions. Yeah. He'll be like he'll he'll range the troop ranks and say you're a coward, you're hanging back, you're the worst, and then he'll walk off. And he says it to people who've been trying really hard, and they'll be really angry and. Somebody else has to be like, man, don't, it's, it's Agamemnon. It's just the way he rolls. He's just trying to get you stoked. Don't pay attention to him. And so he is the great king of the, of the war. And most of the time, people are just saying, like, just, just don't pay attention to the stuff that he says. All right. So, okay, Agamemnon's dead. His son, Orestes, and Electra. So Elect- Orestes has been told by Apollo to come back and avenge his father. And when he arrives, he realizes that his father was killed by his mom. Mm-hmm. And he finds himself in sort of a catch-22 he is obliged right. to avenge his father. In Greek culture, if your dad dies, you got you to gotta go and make that right. But you are also completely forbidden from killing your parents. You can't commit matricide or patricide. So he's in a tough position. If he kills his mom, he has broken Greek law. And if he refuses to revenge his dad, he has broken Greek law and the, the orders of Apollo. So he decides, he, he makes a decision and he kills his mother and then... He has to flee the area, and he is hounded by the Furies. The Furies are these gods that come after you if you commit, you know, some taboo thing, especially murder. And they, they're they like the Greek version of conscience. And so they just hound him and hound him. And eventually— Are they like angry birds? Like, yeah. Is that kind of how they're portrayed? They're horrible looking. And they also show up in the Aeneid when they hound some people into making some bad decisions. They're pretty horrible. Mm-hmm. They're pretty awful. And he flees to Athens to the— to Athena and pleads his case before Athena and says, look, I had to do this. Apollo told me to please release me from the Furies and from this situation I'm in. And she eventually has, holds counsel, casts the deciding vote and lets him off. She says, it's not really your fault. You're acquitted of this. And the Furies are incensed. Like but <laughs> yes, they're furious, furious. which is probably, that's certainly I'm where we get the word. Gotta be. Yeah. And they threaten retaliation on Athens. They say, we are going to wreck this place. And the only thing Athena can do is promise them a place of position in the city. She says, you guys are going to be... To the Furies? Yeah, to the Furies. She says, you guys will have a place of position. <laughs> like, you'll be like the minister of transportation or something? Terrifying. Yeah, but, <laughs> I'm, but she renames them. She says, you are now no longer the Furies. You are the Eumenides. You are, I've given you a new name and a new purpose. You are the kindly ones. You bring joy instead of pain. 
And he, I she feel like you it. would need to do a lot of professional development to get the Furies to be the kind ones. Yeah, not just a name. It's going to take the whole job description changes. There's a lot less traveling. <laughs> <laughs> benefits are great benefits and, are really good and, and they're cool with this the furies are yeah they they, with this? they take it and this this moment is where the curse is resolved and the play by jean paul sartre is about orestes killing his mom and then seeing that the furies want to hound him but he is a man of self-will and self-power and decides not to let the furies deal with it he says i have done what i have done uh, yes i am a murderer but i've done it of my own free will and of my own volition and i refuse your rule yeah theories. that's a very french existentialist way of <laughs> thinking about it yeah and i think there was a quote i wrote down that says the the worst kind of murderer is a murderer with conscience and so he basically refuses conscience and says i'm going to murder and that's what i'm going to do and yeah i did it i claim it but i refuse to be hounded by you furies and electra can't say the same thing and she is hounded to death by these furies essentially and so in, in that play in the start, in that start. play yeah mm. that's that's a far later french version of things but just to recap tantalus the where we get our word tantalize cooks cooks some pies bad news pelops marries hippodamia by chariot stuff and also bad news has atreus and therestes who in turn rape their daughters kill each other's sons and trade the throne around for a while eventually the throne goes to agamemnon who kicks out a just this goes off to war, Aegisthus comes back and hangs out with his wife, Agamemnon returns, is killed by his wife, and then his son Orestes revenges Agamemnon, killing Clytemnestra and Aegisthus, and then goes, and the curse is resolved by the Furies, or by uh, by Athena. Why not just make the Furies uh, Athenian lords or what was it they there they had a position in Athens. Why not just do that way earlier in the line? If the uh, gods on. are just gonna come in and and fix it one second hold on um okay sorry what, say that again well if 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 the I, I, so i'm recording this and in my headphones was playing our outro music left over from the last podcast so I, I literally could not hear you the so outro music was if, so i turned it off we're good if eventually the way that this is resolved is just athena saying like all right furies you now have a job in athens to do and then the end why not just do that back with Tantalus with right? Tantalus. Yeah. Why not just give the Furious a job with Tantalus? Why Tantalus did... didn't deserve it. He did. He did straight evil and deserved his curse. Oh, Orestes, Orestes was in his was catch in twenty two. Catch twenty two. Oh, and, and that is what finally resolved the curse. But every single other action that has happened was was deserved. deserved. Was deserved. Yeah. And their their house was this place of horror and terror and matricide and patricide and brother aside and cousin aside and. Uncle so, aside, it's it's terrible. So this this is a terrible story, and presumably it's coming from a terrible house that per, probably existed in the ancient world. This is what a lot benefit, of this is likely true. But what, the, the short yeah. of the stuff of but gods. what benefit does this sort of story have to be in the consciousness of Greece? Like, how does this story teach or train the student or the warrior or the king um, to seek out a life of virtue? Is it just to like don't do what they did because if you do that, the gods will crush you. Is it just a morality tale? Or my, my answer is multifold. So if this was a family that really existed, then a moral reason for the existence of the tale the, is needless. We don't need to have sure. a moral reason for it to exist if it actually existed, happened. right? If it actually happened. I think it's also a cautionary tale. We stay, we try not to kill our parents and to do these horrible things and I think partially it's just a good story, right? Why do we go to the movie and watch Godfather. good story? Yeah, yeah, The Godfather. It's it's because it's a great story. It's the kind of thing you tell around a campfire about this family that suffered horrors and kings and murder. And I mean, I think part of it has to do with the stuff against killing your family and the basic values of the of the Greek culture, right? Stick with family, protect them all the time, revenge people who need to be revenged. Um, and so... I think there is a there is a moral element, but I don't think this tale was designed for that purpose. Hmm. We may need to rename it the classical stuff you may not want to know. <laughs> <laughs> for this one for sure. But that's good. That was yeah. really good. So that's Dang. the House of Atreus. If you have any more questions or you need to want me to email you a family tree that <laughs> looks more like a a tangle of vines than it does an actual tree or bush. So then after this, Athens became the noble city that we know. I think it was is, already is the noble of, city. Okay. It was already named after Athena. Mm-hmm. 
And this this probably would have been far prior to the Athens that we know. This is the time of Agamemnon, and he he would have sure. lived around 1200 BC. And this means no more Furies. Do the Furies like disappear after this? No, yeah. because they pop up again in the Aeneid. I don't think this is the resolution of the Furies altogether. Gotcha. In the tale, it is. Okay. Cool. How much, how much of this do you? go through with the students like do you read the oristia do you we used to read the oristia but we spent two weeks on it would read it in class and it really on all three plays would just 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 agamemnon just the return of agamemnon home and the murder of clytemnestra because it fits in with the story and it fills in the in-betweeny gaps between iliad and odyssey but the students and i think rightly so said this is a this is a really long time for something that isn't that awesome and we can do this in a lecture so i do it in a lecture now much quickly and i actually introduced them to the house of atreus this last week when we are beginning our stuff for the iliad because it's interesting and it's it's a great tale cool well this has been classical stuff you should know with graham aj and thomas um love your family listeners Mm. just like treat your family well yeah it's a good word no pies yeah avoid pies just stay away from pies yeah just don't if your if your brother is ever like come over for pie and bring your kids say Say we will be having something else we'll bring Uh, our own pie yeah (laughs) um and if you have any questions thoughts concerns feedback criticisms or topics you want us to cover please email us at classical stuff at veritasacademy.net thank you thanks Thanks. for listening signing up bye